everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. My guest today is Diana King. She's also known as the Money Boss Mama on Twitter. Right, Diana? That's right. All right. So I have Diana here today because she has a very interesting story that I saw on Twitter, and I would love for her to talk about herself and what she does. So let me read out the title for this podcast today. She's a single black mom of two who built a $76,000 net worth and a six-figure and a six-month emergency fund and paid off all her debts without ever making a six-figure income. She's here to tell us exactly how she pulled that off because if you're building, you know, a 76k net worth and six-month emergency fund, most people will think, you know, you're making at least well into the six figures or you have like a couple side hustles or, you know, you married rich or you got an inheritance or something like that, you know, but um, apparently she didn't have any of all that, you know, she came up with the bootstraps and built all this and she's here to teach us exactly how she did it. So with that said, Diana, welcome to the podcast today. Yay. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So Diana, tell us your story. You know, I know you were in debt. I know you struggled financially and then you also, you put, you eventually pulled yourself out of that. So walk us through your origin story, if you will. Yeah. So when it all started with my first debt, so Mm. I was 18, you know, I came from a single parent household. My parents divorced when I was in the third grade. And by that time I was living with my mom. And so when I turned 18, I decided it was going to be a very good idea to go out and get a new car. Mm. So I was tired of driving my little hoopty because that's all you know my my mom could afford to give me. Um, and so I decided that I work hard, even though I work as a sonic car hop mm. and fast food. And <laughs> I was going to go out. I'm a big girl. I'm 18 now. And I'm going to go get me a new car because I define financial success by what you have. Right. Mm. And so I figured if I get this new car people are going to think that I'm a lot more well off than I really am. And so it turns out I knew nothing about the process. I didn't know anything about a credit score. I didn't know anything about an interest rate. And so I got hit with a very large interest rate because my mom's credit wasn't the best. I didn't have any credit. So she was the only one that would co-sign for me. Mm. And it wound up that my auto loan payment was taking one of my paychecks per month. I got paid twice Twice. a month. Yeah. And one of them had to go um, to my auto loan. And so when I, it didn't become a really big problem. What car was it? It was a uh, a Volkswagen Passat. It was a brand new Volkswagen Passat. It was used, but it was low mileage. Okay. And so it had like, it was like the luxury kind leather, Mm -hmm. push to start, really Mm. nice. Mm. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> and so I was feeling myself until I got pregnant with my firstborn and life kind of like chin shake me, right? Mm-hmm. How am I supposed to take care of myself and my child? And I'm still having to give up one paycheck per month. Mm. And so it wasn't until I got really, really uncomfortable and I realized like I really cannot afford this that I started to research ways in which how can I get rid of this car? So mm. it started with the auto loan. I went down this rabbit hole of Google. A lot of people seem to think that to be financially successful or have spending freedom, you have to be, you know, like the finance bros. You have to know the lingo. You have to be very good, um, very smart. But mm-hmm. I'm a very basic person. Mm. I'm from Arkansas. I don't know all the big words. So <laughs> I had to simplify it in my head before I could do it, right? Mm. Um, so basically I went down this rabbit hole, Google, trying to figure out how to lower my auto loan. And it spews out these words that you have no idea what they are. So you have to go and research those so, words. So like, what's an example of one of those words that you. So oh. in, that's how I learned about interest. Okay. I oh, know, really? Yeah. I had no idea. Okay. And so I was like, interest. Then I, for the first time I went in and I looked at my balance for the first time since having this auto loan. And I'm like, why is my payment not, why is my balance still high? My payment isn't going anywhere. $200 of that $495 payment was going to interest. Mm. And so I started slowly building that financial literacy um, that way, going down this rabbit hole of figuring out what I don't know. 
And the more I realized what I didn't know, that opened up like this pathway to actually being able to teach myself what these things meant and then going into developing a strategy to get the debt paid off. Mm. So what were some of those steps you had to take? Because like you rightly said, now if 50% of your paycheck is going to pay the car, that means you were making, I'm just saying like about a thousand dollars roughly at the time, right? So what were some of the steps that you took? Because obviously now, I mean, 2012 is like 10 years mm -hmm. away. You kind of crawl out of it. So how did you start? So what, did you actually, you know, take like a financial seminar class or one of those type of things? Or how did you start crawling out of the debts? So I came from the University of Google. Mm. I'm self-taught. But the way that I started, first, I always tell people, it has to be your mentality. You've okay. got to start with that. And you've got to reach that place where you're so sick of being uncomfortable that it forces you to remain consistent. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us start, right? And then something happens. Mm -hmm. It's not moving as quickly as we want it to. We feel like we don't have enough money. And then we quit. And we don't realize if we just stay consistent, you were going to make some progress. It just mm -hmm. may have taken a while. And so... After I got my mentality, because I started first once before and I quit, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not quitting this time. If I keep going, something's going to break. I'm going to have a breakthrough. And then it went to budgeting. Mm. I was that person that was like, I don't know where my money is going. So I had to go find it. And the first budget that I made, um, my expenses did exceed my income. And that's when I learned that I was paying out a lot more than what I was bringing in. So, of course... Discipline has to come in. You've got to make the sacrifice if you really want this. And so I had to let certain things go or a lot of things go, obviously, since I wasn't a high earner. And so nails, hair, all of that, the little, really? little treats. Yes. That had to go. All of that wow. had to go. I got my kids clothes from um, the thrift store, like consignment sales and Goodwill. I was determined to get this debt paid off. And one thing I will say that really accelerated my journey as well, that a lot of people don't see as an opportunity, is extra income. Like if you get okay. a tax refund, what are you doing with that tax refund? That's a way in which you can leverage and make up for lost time. So what I would do is like a 70, 20, 10 allocation method, just okay. depending on what was my main goal. So if it was debt, 70% of that went to debt, 20% went to savings, and then 10% I just used for personal fun. And that way I got to enjoy a little bit of that money, but 90% went to something that was moving the needle forward in my life. And so tax refunds were only about two three thousand dollars but still that helped me to make progress a lot faster because even though i made this lump sum payment i would still make my regular payments mm -hmm. so it was like I, I paid it up for six months and then just left it alone mm -hmm. i learned that the hard way interest is still going to eat you alive so i would pay it up and then i would make my regular payments that way extra 10 15 dollars because that's all i had and then as the debt dwindled what I learned was that that puts more money in my budget. So if I could get rid of this lowest, this lowest balance credit card, once that was done, that put an extra $50, $60 that I could apply to my other debts. And it started this snowball method. Yes, it took four years, but I was still able to do it without making six figures. So in those four years, you literally just like focused on the debt, cut down on things like, like you said, your hair, nails, you know, makeup, going to the thrift store. That, that must have been like a real period of pain because oh you know, go, going from like, you know, <laughs> showing everybody you're a baller, you know, getting the leather option, Passat <sighs> and everything to like, you know, doing it like, I, I can assume you were cooking at home and not eating out and all those things. That must have been like a real solid period of pain. Do you, do you think like, you know, most people would want to subject themselves to that kind of pain because you first of all knew that hey if you didn't get out of this that there'd probably be no way out for you yes i saw it as that just that mm. if i don't do this now there's literally going to be no way out for me if i don't take on this little bit of motivation and optimism that i have and kind of work with that 
there's there's no way out. And then when I realized that I was the blueprint for my children, like they were mm. watching me, kids may not do as you say, but they'll do as you do. Mm. And so these two kids are on me. And that that fueled and kept me consistent within these four years. And now, yes, I did cut out a lot. Um, I don't expect other people to have that same level of discipline um, and dedication as me. But for me, I saw the vision. I saw the end goal. And when I, whenever I have that vision, I'm willing to do whatever mm. to get to it. And so that all or nothing mentality really did help me. And I will say with my credit card debt, one thing that I started realizing through the University of Google was that there was this world of side hustling. Mm. Right. And so what I did was I made a list of my four skills. I was like, okay, what skills do I have? Because going into it, I didn't feel like I had anything to offer. Mm -hmm. But writing was always something that I enjoyed. So I Say that again. writing. Okay. Yeah. Writing. And so I actually went to college for writing too. So I'm like, well, what could I do with this writing? Because everyone was like, can you help me with my paper? Could you help me proofread? And so I started, I went to Google and said, how to make extra money writing. And it came up with freelance writing. Mm. And so I would find opportunities online to write for other people. And then when those clients, you did a good job and they like their work, they like your work, they become recurring customers. Mm -hmm. And so I would make two to $400 a month because I realized this extra $30 towards my credit cards wasn't going to cut it. Mm. I need extra money. And so I would freelance when my daughter went to sleep and when my kids were sleeping and then on the weekends and sometimes it's time consuming, but that two to $400, obviously it helped me break ground when it came to the credit cards and it helped me pay it off faster as well as transferring my balances to a 0% intro APR card. So no interest, extra money, knocked it out a lot faster. Good, good. So now let's talk a little bit about that side hustling because, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you're reading the news, watching, you see that, you know, inflation is going sky high. So in as much as people might be trying to get out of debt, things are costing more, food is costing more, life is generally costing yeah. more. And then um, side hustling, you found clients and all that. So for someone who, you know, had a full-time job and then started hustling nights and weekends, could you walk us through some of those steps you took to like find the exact side hustle? Like, you know, how did you apply? How did you find the right person? You know, all those type of little A, B, C, D, E steps that if somebody listening to this today says, oh, wow, I think I could also do what Diana is doing. Let mm -hmm. me go follow this roadmap that she laid out and let's see um, uh, how I can get to the same results. Yeah. And so the simplest way to do it, I would say, first of all, write out your skills. Don't think of it in your head. Make a bulleted list of what you're good at that you could possibly monetize. And then from that list, write out how you can monetize each skill, depending on which one, you know, stands out the most to you that you really feel like you could be consistent with. Because if you're like me, you're a single parent you're already stretched thin, right? And I know that the idea of side hustling can turn a lot of people off because you're like, how am I finding the time to do this? Mm. And so you want to make sure that whatever you do is going to be worth the time that you're putting in. You don't want to put in four hours and you only made $10. That's mm -hmm. not, you know, you, you don't want to go that route. And then depending on whichever one or two skills that you really feel like you can monetize, it's a simple web search. We literally have the world at our fingertips now with the internet. And so you can go online depending on your skill and look at how to monetize those skills. And there are a lot of job boards that I found that are online for, even if it's just not freelance writing, but just freelancers in general. general there are sites like, yeah. like, yeah, you know, Fiverr that you could literally sell your skills on. And then when you get those clients and you do a good job, they're going to want to work with you again uh -huh. because you've proven to them that you have high quality work. And so you can make online portfolios that list out your skills, any uh, examples of the work that you have. That's what I use, like an online portfolio for my writing. So when you and, say online portfolio, not a website, just like a static page or what yeah, exactly do you mean? 
it's like a um it's like a static page i can't okay. think of the website that i use right now Wix, but, Wix or yeah any of those type of things something like Wix, and it's like okay. in, instead of an in paper resume mm -hmm. it's like a, a digital resume Okay. That you can link your pages to, and I had a little blog at that time too. So I anything that I could use, I was linking into it just so okay. I had some proof in the beginning, and still I until I started to get you know the proof from the client work that I had. Okay. okay. Good. Good. So how long did you do that up until you built the um, 76K in network? Because now you spent four years digging yourself out of a <laughs> death hole, right? Uh -huh. So now I believe you have side hustling in place. You have your daytime nine to five job in place. Now, how did you go and now expand the pie to, you know, sucking away 76K, whether it's in, you know, your 401K IRA or stocks or whatever it is? Yeah. So I will say with the side hustle, it helped me pay off that credit card debt faster, um, but it really didn't help with the net worth part. Well, I guess okay. it did because the lower the debt, the higher your, you know, the more your assets are going to be able to shine in their entirety. Yeah. Um, so I, my journey did not come without many, many ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's and, hear some of the ups and downs. <laughs> and so I went into debt like four more times during my, those four years. And oh, so wow. when I got knocked on my butt, I had to pick myself right back up. And that's why I said it's very important to start with your mindset. Like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to stay consistent. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when life hits you, you're going you're going to quit. And everything that you build up to that point, you're going to lose out on. And so whenever I got pregnant with my son, a few months after I started my debt-free journey, here comes childcare again. I finally mm -hmm. got rid of childcare, got pregnant. Now here comes childcare, maternity leave, and all of that. Mm. So once the my credit life card happened. Debt, life happened, and so when my credit card debt got manageable, I then used the funds from that side hustle to build my maternity leave fund because I wasn't going to get paid in my entirety, mm. and also I used it to side hustle what I would need to make up for childcare. So I needed about 200 extra dollars um, to keep my debt payments the same. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I, I set a goal in a year to pay off my, my last credit card and my auto loan to pay it off in its entirety. And so to keep my debt payment the same, I had to side hustle for that extra money so that my son's childcare didn't eat everything. So mm. I, Moved out of my apartment to a little crappy apartment at the end of the lease. That saved me $120. And then it came with free water. So that saved me money too. Mm. And so based on my savings, I'm like, this is what I need to keep my debt payment the same. Then I can get out of this crappy apartment within a year's time. And once again, going back to you being so uncomfortable, you leaving yourself no choice but to stay consistent. I was tired of living with roaches. Mm. And so <laughs> that was all I needed to stay consistent on that, paid off my last credit card, paid off my auto loan, and got the heck out of there to a better apartment. Mm. And then after that, the side hustling for the freelance writing, I let that go because now I don't have those two payments taking from my pay. I've got extra money in my budget now. Okay. So you did some downsizing and then, you know, use the freelancing to make up money for your kids' payment. But back to the 76K. So how did that come about? <laughs> so that really started to take off the last year and a half of okay. my debt-free journey. Okay. So I was always kind of contributing to my 401K. That is the book, uh, the bulk of my net worth. Mm -hmm. And so since I don't have any debt or liabilities taken from these assets... They can just shine in their entirety. So the bulk of it is 401k. I'm at about 8% now that I'm contributing to that. Then I have my Roth RA that I set up last year. And then I put the most, the majority of my extra money towards my Roth RA. And I started investing in single stocks first before the Roth RA or anything else like that. Um, a little backwards but i have single stocks uh shares and single stocks that i have also so with me it was a very simple game plan i knew that 
the more that I pay off these debts, the higher my net worth will be. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't have any debt. My income mostly goes towards my Roth IRA and my 401k. So how much were you making in this year and a half that you were able to, because you said you never made a six figure income. So what was your um, annual income at this point in time? Uh, I started my journey at $32,000. Okay. So about $15 an hour. And then I paid off all of my debt in 2020, the worst year ever for a lot of people, but it was mm -hmm. the best for me because stimulus checks are coming in. Mm. I have my incentive. Those got shoveled up to debt and to my investments too. Um, and I would sell my PTO too to help me fund my investments and my debt. What do you mean? So a PTO sell back. Um, mm -hmm. Some companies allow you to sell back unused PTO. Okay. So for my company, anything over 80 hours, we can sell back. So if I had 200 hours of PTO, I could sell back 120 and get that act oh, wow. paycheck. Yeah. And so, like I was saying, when you're so dead set on a goal, you're going to see opportunity for things. Yeah. So, yeah. So you were finding money within like what you were already getting without even... Like having to do too much extra. I'm, I'm finding, I'm literally looking at my situation and I'm going in with the mentality of how can I make this work? Not, mm. this is why it can't work. No, uh-uh. How can I make this work? Mm. And I'm finding opportunities and day-to-day -day things that I didn't see the opportunity in because I'm that focused on getting there. Okay. So you started from 32, then by 2020, how much yeah. did you make it? So by 2020, I was at about 55000 Okay. And that included also making a little money through my Instagram page by this time. Okay. So it was about 50000 for from my day job. And then yeah. I had about 5000 that I made from Instagram. And so that was what I ended the debt-free journey with. Now, I'm at roughly 80000 with still, I'm still making about 54000 at my day job, but I've still, I've been able to bring in more income through my Instagram page. And obviously that helps as well. Wow. So that's almost like what, uh, 25000 from IG? Yeah. Yeah. And that started last year. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about that because this is an interesting <laughs> trajectory because now people can see that, hey, Diana doesn't have like two heads. She didn't do anything magical, right? You uh -huh. still have a day job bringing in 55K, which which is probably good in many parts. Like mm -hmm. I know if you live in New York City, it probably might be a oh, struggle. Yeah. <laughs> but like in Arkansas, right? It's, it's a good living, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, then you now have this Instagram side hustle. Talk a little bit about the Instagram. Yeah. And so I joined Instagram at like the end of 2018 because I was desperate for community. And I also knew that um, from whenever I'm doing my research and I was trying to find people to help me pay off debt, like get some tips, it was always a two income household. Mm. And it was always like um, that person making six figures. And I'm like, this does not resonate with me. And I would get so frustrated and I would click out the blog post or click oh. out the podcast. And I'm like, there's literally nothing in front of me that's going to tell me that I can do it. And so whenever I started gaining traction, um, gaining progress on my journey and I'm showing, I have the proof that it's working. I figured that Whoever looks like me, single mom, black woman, doesn't have a high um, high income, they mm -hmm. need to know this. Mm -hmm. They need to know this and we need more representation. And so I started Instagram just documenting my debt-free journey, literally. Mm -hmm. I just started documenting my debt-free journey. And the more that I'm learning, I would, I would put it in a post. I learned this and I'm doing this and this is how I'm doing this. And because I was so generous with what I was doing. I wasn't withholding any information because I wasn't trying to make an income off of mm -hmm. it. Um, I started to gain, I gained like 10,000 followers in less than a year. Oh, and then wow. it just started growing from there because people are like, thank you. I could not resonate with anyone else's story, but seeing you do it mm -hmm. keeps me motivated. And so they're literally the reason why I kept going on with this page. And then they just literally follow my journey. Mm. 
Oh, interesting. And then I noticed on Twitter you were talking about um, uh, you were having a discussion yesterday, I believe, with a bunch of ladies where you talked about um, financial independence, right? And actually get into that debt-free journey and making money. And I think mm -hmm. one of the main things that people were talking about was basically, uh, let me pull it up here. Um, I had so many women share that they feel their partners are an obstacle to reaching mm -hmm. spending freedom. Choose wisely or risk attaching yourself to liabilities. So let's <laughs> dive into that a little bit deeper because debt-free journey, yes, as a single mom, you were able to do it. But some, there are also women that are in relationships, marriages, and all that too. And you know, families are still struggling with this debt-free journey. Uh, what did you discover in this conversation that um, affects relationships and money? Or how does money affect many women in their relationship, whether they're black or otherwise? So it's like a it's like a night and day mix that I. Okay. And so I have a lot of women who want to leave their situations, who are unhappy in their situations, who are unsafe in their in their relationships, but they can't leave because they don't have the financial means to. Mm. And so they come to me and they're trying to get help paying off debt and saving money just so they can leave their relationship. Wow. They're stuck. And then I have another side where it's hard for them to financially progress because they're taking care of their partner. And that wasn't the, the agreement before the relationship started. And so with that tweet that came from a post that I had where I was sharing my experience of taking care of a partner and kids as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically caring for three people on not a high income and it made my financial journey ridiculously tough. Yeah. And I find that whenever you are on a financial journey as a woman, it's very easy to be gaslit into situations that are not helping your finances, whether that is you. What's an being... example of that? So an example of being gaslit. So let's say that this person doesn't have, they're not, you're not equally yoked financially. Maybe okay. they don't have a job or maybe they're not um, bringing in as much as you it's very easy to feel bad for that person. Mm. And it's very easy for that person to manipulate you into feeling bad for them. Well, you make more money than me, so you should mm -hmm. pay for it. Mm. Or if you give me this and help me out to get a car or da da da, then I could get a job and start making more money. Mm. And then those broken promises, they never those promises never come to fruition. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Mm -hmm. And so I've I've lost thousands behind a relationship because I didn't ask the right questions before I went into that relationship. And I didn't know to ask the right questions or to really um, observe this person's financial habits before we got attached. Because once you get attached to that person, your discernment kind of goes out the window. And it's very easy to get stuck in a situation that's taken from you. Mm. So what are some of the questions someone needs to ask before they get into a relationship about a person's financial habits or what are some of those red flags or observable things that you need to notice because like you said you know if you go into a relationship and you don't know the person's financial habits or even what their debts and assets are even before the relationship that could be another anchor that could drag you down if you're trying mm. to achieve financial independence and uh, freedom yeah and I feel like a lot of us, we don't ask those questions because we feel like it's tacky or that person's going to think that we want something from them. When mm -hmm. in reality, that's not it at all. You're mm -hmm. doing your due diligence by protecting yourself mm -hmm. in your financial situation, right? Mm -hmm. And so some questions that I like to tell people to ask, and of course, it's going to depend on your where you are in the dating phase with this person, but you could just simply ask them to give them you know, room to express themselves. How do you feel about debt? How do you feel about generational wealth? Mm. How do you feel about joint bank accounts? One good thing that's important to ask, how do you feel about, you know, 50-50, splitting expenses equally with your partner? Is it 7-30? Mm. Because that's something that I see now with our culture causes a lot of arguments, the whole 50-50 thing. But when you say 50-50, in regards to what, just the bills alone or like going out to eat or what? 
all of the expenses. Like okay. if you move in together, are we splitting the rent? Are okay. we splitting the utilities? Okay. So you want to know what is their perspective on these things? What is their uh, perspective on wealth building? Some people don't realize their partner is in six figure debt until they're walking down the aisle. Uh -huh. And then suddenly it becomes part of your problem because you're now having to make a life with this person and they're being weighed down, you know, um, by, by debt. debt. And so once you really sit back and observe this person's spending habits, you can go out together. You can go to a mall. Um, how is this person spending their money? How is this person spending their time? And then it's literally up to you to decide, is that something that you're willing to compromise? Is that something you're willing to accept? Do you feel like you can make this work with this person? But if not, if you're seeing those red flags, it's probably best to to go ahead and walk now before you start gaining that attachment to that person. Mm. So in the situation, like you mentioned earlier, where one person makes less than the other, does 50-50 still apply? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or do you have to like, you know, prorate it based on each person's income? Like we have a progressive tax where the richer you are, the less you pay, something like that. Yeah. The, the wealthier you are, the more you pay on the expenses. You know, I hear from certain people, like the person who has the higher income, they'll yeah. normally take the larger expenses. And then the person that has the lower income, they'll take like the utilities, like okay. the water bill and things like that. Okay. Um, and it may be a male, female thing too that comes into play. Okay. When you, so so when you say male female that means the men prefer to pay more of the bills and take on more of the weight right yeah some okay. some men prefer to take more of the weight because they see them that i'm the man i should be the provider and some mm. women follow suit with that too and I, that's once again going into those questions that it's important to ask in the beginning just to make sure that you're on the same page you know um, when it comes to how you want to split the expenses or if you want someone to take care of all of the expenses and there are, you want the man to do that, then you need to make sure that you're asking those questions in the beginning so you're not disappointed whenever it's time for you to combine forces. So when it comes to things like, you know, um, spending, because now we've talked a lot about debt, getting out of debt, making money, uh -huh. putting things into 401k savings, selling back your PTO and all that stuff. When it comes to like really enjoying yourself and splurging, what do you think about that? Because that's another area where, especially now that, you know, the economy might be tanking, but a lot mm -hmm. of us have been cooped up at home for the past year and a half, two years. So people kind of want to go away, take a trip or something, but you still have that debt and you still have yeah. those bills to pay. How does one do that in a way that it doesn't affect their overall debt um, financial freedom journey? Yeah. So I know that it's kind of split in the money community. There are some that like to go extreme and basically stop all discretionary spending mm. so they can hit their financial goals and then live their life later. I'm someone where I say that financial responsibility and treating yourself, the two are not mutually exclusive. Okay. You can spend money and still be financially responsible. Um, so I think one major way that's really important is to align your values with your spending. So value-based spending. Okay. Look through your bank accounts over the past 30 days and look at all of your discretionary spending. Are these things that you actually value? Or is it just something that was impulsive or you made an emotional purchase? And then from there, you want to choose what you're actually going to spend money on that align with your values and your goals. So this is where the budget comes in. What is your main goal? If you're budgeting without a goal, it's like you're going nowhere fast. So I like to uh, recommend goal-based budgets. You have your main goal. Maybe that's you paying off um, your American Express credit card. So depending on that end goal date, you want to have a deadline. Otherwise, you'll keep putting it off, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have your deadline to kickstart you, you know, to kickstart your journey, but also so you can calculate how much you need to apply to that goal to reach it by the end date. And then let's say maybe you need $200 a month to reach this goal. So you would put that $200 in your budget with your essential expenses. You need to pay your rent and everything. And then you would add your discretionary spending in after that. 
and make it work with your spendable income. And this way, you're able to pay your bills. You're still hitting your financial goals because you built your budget around it and you made your discretionary spending work within whatever was left over. So you made it work with your spendable income and that way it forces you to reevaluate what you're actually purchasing because you may not have much left over, but you still have something. And it's important mm-hmm. to give yourself something. A lot of people try to, they let that shame talk them out of treating themselves here and there. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a $6 coffee mm-hmm. three times a week, you know? But you need something to keep you motivated and you need something to to inspire you. Otherwise, the journey is going to be hell. Mm. And if the journey is hell and your budget is hell, it's making you unhappy, you're not going to stick with it. Mm. Okay. So as we reach the uh, end of the podcast, this has been very insightful and helpful. I, I can see here that, you know, in as much as you started not knowing some of the financial terms, you've picked up quickly because now you're bringing in different lingo where it's like (laughs) you're now part of money twitter and you're now part of like the gang you know you're using the same terminology that you probably didn't know earlier so do i am i assuming correctly that you are doing financial coaching on your instagram or how can people reach out to you to learn more and possibly connect with you so if a single mom somewhere Let's say, oh, I don't know, North Dakota is reading this and she, or watching this and she's like, hey, you know what? I really um, resonated with what Diana was saying. How can I get in touch with her and learn from her? And I know she's like, you know, just like me because we're kind of on a similar journey. What are some, yeah. some tips you can give or, you know, how can people reach out to you? Yeah. So I'm new to the um, Twitter world, but Mm -hmm. I have an amazing community on Instagram. And so you can always DM me on Instagram at moneybossmama. And I also have um, a spending challenge coming up where I'm going to be able to have like a text message thread with everyone in the challenge too, um, just so I can work alongside them as well. Okay. So I just put that in the, uh, oh, wow, this is cool. I'm, I'm using this tech for the first time and I'm learning <laughs> some things. So is it money.boss.mama or all together? Um, the name is, uh, that's correct, with the dots on my oh, dots. social media okay. handles. It okay. is all together. Okay, good. So glad I got it. So, so that's it. So thanks for coming to share your story, Diana. I appreciate you taking the time to teach us more about how to apply some of these practical steps to get out of debt. And I hope that somebody listening to this podcast will, you know, take actionable steps, you know, to get out of debt and, you know, get on the path to financial freedom. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Oh.